so thanks for joining us first of all and You're thanks, for having, thanks for having a being creative deck in the deck hive library so that people can make use of it uh, on the online platform it's my pleasure and i'm so excited that it's on there uh, so what do you want to give us a bit of background about you first of all and uh, and how you came to end up where you did absolutely um my first career actually was that of an accountant, which uh, most people find hard to believe, because what I do now is work in the field of creativity. And you would imagine that um, if you were to combine the two career paths, you'd probably have a straight path to prison. But I've managed to avoid that unfortunate uh, outcome. And what I do now is I actually use creativity and creative thinking and creative problem solving in particular to help people navigate change more effectively and easily. So that is what I do now. And um, I think I bring a little bit of my accountant self to um, be more realistic about how to do that and to be more action oriented around how to be mm. creative. Mm. Yeah, it must, must sort of stand you in good stead then when you're kind of working with people who have maybe more traditional backgrounds because uh, exactly. being able to make the links is, is really important, isn't it? Yeah. So being there? able to speak both languages. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can see how that would be helpful. <laughs> and I love, I love the background, by the way, that you've got behind you. That's, that's very creative. That speaks creativity, doesn't it, as well? Oh, thank you. It's actually a picture I took of some artwork I really liked at a museum. <laughs> <laughs> excellent well it's a very fitting backdrop um so so how about the um the cards then why, why did you create a deck of cards ah, i um at the age of 40 i decided that i needed to get a degree in creativity and creative thinking and uh, one of the things that i experienced as i was going through the graduate program in the study of creativity was that there was so much research and so much theory out there around what it means to be creative. And yet there weren't enough breadcrumbs for people to follow in terms of things that they could do in order to develop um, a practice of being creative, a habit for being creative. It was difficult for people to imagine what it looked like and sounded like and felt like to be a creative individual. So it became my mission to really look at all of the research around being creative and um, look at all of the skills and, and the mindset and even the heart set for what it means to be creative and um, pare that down to what are the most essential skills that we need to identify. And so for my master's project, I actually researched all of the the leading authorities on uh, the original research around creativity and creative skills from JP Guilford to E. Paul Torrance to Teresa Mable, who's a more um, current researcher. And I identified that there were at least 22 unique skills that were associated with being creative. Now, if you tell someone there are 22 skills you need to learn in order to be creative, you've lost them. That's, mm. that's um, very daunting. So my next phase was to really identify and narrow it down to what are the top eight to 10 skills that um, have the greatest impact, that make the greatest difference. And um, what I've arrived at now is really a culmination of a lot of that work. And I'm happy to explain what those skills are if you'd like me to. Yeah, it'd be good to hear a bit more. And, and so, and when, when about what was it then you were doing all this work? Was it well, I, an extended period of time, I guess? It, it has been. So it's been over the last 12 years that I've been working in this arena. I um, did my master's project in 2013. And so the original version of this deck came out in 2013. But over time, I've continued to work on it because um, I've done so much work in the field. I work with educators, I work with scientists, I work with students, I work with um, parents, with individuals um, as a coach. And so through that experience, I've been able to refine the original deck to arrive at what I think now is um, a much more effective uh, collection of mindsets and heart sets. 
Mm, so, yeah, and so do, these, do you want to tell us, can you tell us a bit more about those skills then and talk us through absolutely. that? Absolutely. So what we've boiled it down to is that um, imagine it's like a set of nested dolls. So one of those matryoshka dolls from mm -hmm. Russia, the innermost um, set of skills that lies at the heart of what it means to be creative are what we identify as the three core skills of being curious, being open, and being original. And sometimes I even play with the word being inventive because that says more to people. Um, one of the things you'll notice is that the words that I'm going to be using to associate with the skills are much more plain language, hopefully words that people can relate to because there's so much jargon ar around creativity. Mm -hmm. So the, those are the three core skills, being, cre being curious, being open, and being original. Mm -hmm. Then around that, um, the next layer is what I think of as the affective skills. And the affective skills are really kind of your attitude to the world. It's, it's the way that you, um, your core skills interact with the world around them. What is the layer through which you see and the lens through which you see the world around you? And those three skills are being mindful, which you know, was not a skill that existed in original research because mindfulness is really something that we started to talk about far more in the last 20 years than we did 60 years ago when the research around creativity started. So being mindful is one of the key skills. There's also being optimistic. And that I sometimes speak about as being hopeful because you really need to have this idea that something better is possible in order to um, engage in creative work, to engage in creative thinking and creative problem solving. And then um, the third is being playful. And again, that is something that, um, you know, Stuart Brown from IDEO might, might speak about, but being playful is really about having this sense of being experimental, being willing to try things you haven't tried before in a way that um, is lighthearted and, and doesn't have a lot of fear associated with it. So those are the three affective pieces. And then we uh, move on to the three skills, which really I think of as the transformational skill set, because without these three skills, all of the work that you do in an effort to be creative remains inside. But what translates um, your creative thinking, your creative habits and your creative attitudes into an outcome are the three transformational skills, which are being driven. So that is being motivated, being, you know, it's, it's persevering, it's going after something. It's being deliberate. So having a process, because we so often have these wonderful ideas, but no way to bring them to reality, no way to actually operationalize them. And uh, the third is being courageous, because if anything, being creative and putting that out in the world is really an act of courage. And so being courageous is a big part of what it means to be creative. So those are the nine skills. And um, those are the nine skills that I cover um, in the deck. Yeah. Well, should we share the deck then so people can see Absolutely. Uh, the, the cards and relate to what you've just been saying to the structure of the deck itself? So let me just share my screen and we can do that. Uh, has that worked? Yes, it has. Thank you. Excellent. So, um, uh, so what do we have here? What are we looking at? So on the left, you have the three core skills of being open, being curious, and being original. And um, Martin, if you were to show them how you um, got to those cards, then yes, sure. we can talk about the fact that you have more than one card per skill, obviously. Um, we have between eight to nine cards per skill. And for each card, um, you'll see that they're color coded. But for each card, there are two sides. So if we were to click on one of the cards, Martin, um, perhaps the very first one on the left, you'll see that there is actually one side which invites you to be reflective. So it gives you something to think about. 
And on the flip side of the card is a way in which you can um, put that particular reflection into action. Now, I'm very aware that there would be multiple ways in which we could operationalize being open. And so the reflection on, on the flip side really is an invitation for you to also think about additional ways in which you might take action around that. Um, and we get you started by offering you one way in which to be open on the, on the reverse. Similarly, we have all the cards are set up the same way. Every single one of them has the reflection on one side and then an action on the other. And these, the actions are really practices. They are ways in which you can demonstrate that you're being curious. It's a way to acquire the habit. It's a way of putting something into practice so that you can actually make, create outcomes that will work for you. And we'll have a way to understand how this looks like um, when you're trying to be playful or mindful or, um, optimistic or any of the mm -hmm. any of the skills i see that one of the um, skills is missing in the third set yeah so, that's going to add that in for you now so thank you and i think that's being courageous and we can take absolutely and i think that might be the card that actually um the one that you just pulled martin mm -hmm. if you could flip that for me Okay, this is, this is a card that I think we have used so often in the last, um, last year and a half during the pandemic. In all the workshops that I've done, we've talked about a tolerance for ambiguity because if nothing else, um, we have had a crash course in living with, with uncertainty and ambiguity in this year. Mm. And um, this, has, this has been something that I keep trying to invite people to think about is that you don't have to have all the answers and the stress, a lot of our daily stress comes from the fact that we think we have to have all the daily, the answers to all of the problems that we face on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But it's perfectly all right to say, I don't know the answer to that yet, but I'm willing to try and figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that makes all the difference to your mental state of mind. And in a sense, what happens is that these cards are all inter, uh, interactive and they are all interconnected so by being courageous and by being mindful around being courageous you are actually um, opening yourself up to being creative at a greater level so mm -hmm. the cards you might find have some overlap but that's absolutely natural because um, being creative is such a natural and organic thing that it's impossible to um, have have it in silos. So there is there is a lot of interactivity between the cards. Yeah, excellent. So there's all sorts of rich kind of content in there across all these nine different areas, aren't there? Um, so it's really useful that they've got that kind of color coding. It's useful that they've got that twin input on either side of the card. So. So when you designed them in this way, then what was your expectation about how they were going to be used as a set? What kind of things were you imagining would be done with them? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you that what I imagined would be done with them. Um, I, people have far exceeded my expectations. I uh, originally just uh, was thinking about using them for creativity workshops, for innovation workshops and what I started to find was that people were using these cards with their families, with their teams, with their um, as ways in which to develop themselves on a personal level. I've had people from as far as China buy these cards. I mean, I've recently shipped a deck of cards to Fiji, which, mm -hmm. by the way, let me tell you, is an expensive place to ship to. And I was trying very hard to get them to take the virtual deck. Uh, because I think that um, people are really craving ways in which they can um, change their lives one practice at a time, one habit at a time. So the original intent was to use it in a very traditional um, workshop setting around uh, developing habits for being creative. When we talk about creativity as an essential skill that um, 
comes before you can innovate. And what I started to find is that people were using this in their daily lives. They weren't just using it at work. And, um, and then I had educators start to get interested in using these cards because what they found was that they could start to adapt them for use in the classroom. Mm. And um, they were starting to use these cards to become creative role models for their students. And actually my very first clients who bought, you know, before we had the option to go virtual, um, these were used at a conference for scientists. And they bought 150 wow. decks to give away a, a deck to each scientist in the room because they really felt as if um, scientists are taught to be such critical thinkers that they lose the value of also being creative. Mm. And finding the right balance between the two was very important for them. And this was the first uh, resource that they could find that really gave them something to do. You know, it was it wasn't just theory, it was really practice. Yeah, and yeah. so we've had the cards have been used in multiple, multiple ways. Um, I'm always surprised when people tell me that um, in all the ways that they do use the cards, I have people who will um, carry cards in their in their wallets and and pull them out or use them with their families. Right? So a family might mm -hmm. agree that they're going to try um interacting with each other in a new way and and they will use a card and um and change the way yeah. that they relate to each other so so they're being creative in the way they apply using them as well not just in the creativity around the content exactly, uh, which, is, exactly. which is kind of a playful way of doing it isn't it absolutely oh and people are using this companies are now using this for professional development because uh, for them for personal development um, when people are getting evaluated, they're being asked to um, take on a commitment to being, being um, creative and identifying which of the nine skills they want to use as an entry point. Mm. And as we ask people to be more creative, in fact, I think one of the tables that we set up, Martin, uh, it might be the second one, That's has an example of that. So um, this is an example of somebody who might say, I really need to work on being more playful. And I need to start to develop the habit for being more playful. I need to introduce playfulness into my life. And here are some ways in which you might do that. And uh, so imagine if you were a manager and you were doing uh, an evaluation, end of year evaluation with an employee and setting some goals for the coming year. There might be certain things that you could pick from the card deck and say, well, let's see if any of these might work for you. And an individual might, just like we are doing here, have a selection of cards and be able to say, yeah, that's one I'd I would like to try. And this is how I'm going to apply it. And this is where I'm going to apply it. Or uh, perhaps that's not one I'm comfortable with right now. And I might push that out to later. So there are, um, one of my theories, my personal theory for change is that I don't believe in this idea of stepping outside your comfort zone in order to grow because stepping outside your comfort zone is the scariest place to be. And as we know from personal experience, fear is not a great motivator for mm -hmm. learning. So I always tell people grow from within your comfort zone. So out of, out of the many choices that you have, identify the one that's the least scary and then start with that. And Great. once you, once you've got that under your belt, then the next one starts to feel attainable and achievable. So move on to that. So taking something like this and doing a card sort so that you can actually say, that's the one I want to start with. This is the next one. That's the third one. And that's the fourth one. And saving that so that you know kind of what is your trajectory and you have something that's measurable in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fab. So I know you had an, an, an example with somebody uh, in Jordan. Um, oh. Was that related to what you're just saying? Or was that, that was a different, different person? 
Actually, in Jordan, the way that we did this, uh, we used the cards that was with a group of educators. Mm -hmm. And um, I had about 30 educators and every day, every educator had to pick two cards, one for themselves and one for someone else. And they would walk around the room and have a conversation with someone around something that that person was hoping to, uh, a way in which that person was hoping to grow. And then they would select a card out of the two that they were holding. And sometimes they had to give up the card they had saved for themselves and, and give that card to the other person. And the other person had to commit to trying what was on that card within the next 24 hours. Okay. And so it was almost as if you were being forced to do something that, you know, someone else had written a prescription for you and you now had mm -hmm. to follow that prescription. And one of the teachers came to me um, the next day and she was in tears. And she said to me, I cannot thank you enough for what you've done for me. And I couldn't understand what she was talking about. And the card that she was, um, she had received was one around being I think it was the one around being driven. And it was the time, it was the card that says, take the time to face your fears and consider before you take a risk, what is the worst case scenario? And then how you can reduce that risk from happening. How can you live with the remaining risk? And it turns out that she had suffered from crippling anxiety for, for decades. And every morning, if she had to get out of the house by nine o'clock in the morning, she was awake by 4 a.m. because it took her at least five hours to overcome her anxiety around leaving the house. Wow. And she received this card. And what she did was when she woke up at four o'clock in the morning, she started to journal her responses to the stems on the card. And as she journaled, she said her anxiety just melted away because all of a sudden she had something concrete that she could do around addressing her anxiety. She could pare her anxiety down from this big amorphous thing down to something that was um, that actually felt like she could either live with it or do something about it. And she said that now she was going to do this every day and I still hear from her. So this, this incident happened about four years ago wow. and I still get updates from her about how her life has been transformed by just this one practice this daily practice and she says now for the first time in her life she has to set an alarm to wake herself up in the morning because anxiety doesn't wake her up early anymore and it wow. was just amazing, so remarkable yes and and is, are there many of are there many occasions where things like that have happened where it's kind of gone beyond creativity and, and more into that kind of personal development space, uh, even when maybe you haven't necessarily set out with that intention of doing that. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the secret that I'm going to tell you, Martin, um, is that I never built this deck in the hope of making people more creative so that they could go and be more innovative in organizations and pad someone's bottom line. It was never about that. Um, for me, creativity has always been a skill set that changes lives. It's about transforming people. It's about transforming their experiences of life. I mean, that's what brought me to the study of creativity. It's mm. because creativity saved my life. And um, I, the fact that, that even these little habit changers can change the trajectory of where you're headed and how you're getting there and um, how much resilience you have and how much um, how easily you can take advantage of the opportunities that exist can you see the opportunities that exist in your life you know can you take advantage of them can you overcome the hurdles that stand in the way of you getting to where you want to be and what you want to achieve creativity makes all of that possible mm -hmm. and these actions while each one of them might seem like very small and insignificant. They have a butterfly effect and they can, they can really start to create some very big changes as you move forward um, and, and make these kinds of thinking a habit. That's why the reflection piece is important because the back of the card has only one way, but the reflection 
invites you to think of many different ways. So hopefully Mm -hmm. as people acquire the habit, they also think of new ways in which to put some of these things into action. Uh, thank you. It's really nice to hear that that kind of context. I mean, there's a powerful thing you said there about it saving your life. And do you, do you want to say anything more about that, or would you rather not go there today? No, I I don't mind. Um, I, as you know, as I started this conversation, mentioning I was an accountant. I actually was an auditor. I and I was a very. Um, I, I worked for one of the big five companies. I was in every sense of the word. I was what they would deem, you know, successful. And, and an overachiever, academic uh, achievements, accolades, you name it, I had it. And so you would think that if anyone was set up to do well in life, that would be someone um, with, with the kind of background that I, I had. And then I faced a challenge that nothing in my trajectory had prepared me for. And that was becoming a mother. And as a parent, every single day, I was facing these these challenges that had no known solutions that were really impossible to to solve in the moment and would emotionally hijack me. And I struggled so much, especially because I had um, two children just back to back and I was um, really managing alone. I had very little support from family because all of my family family lived in another country. I felt isolated. My husband was in uh, doing a medical residency, so he was never home. And I was really almost like a single parent bringing up these two children. And I was at my wits end and um, suffering from, from a lot of guilt and depression related to that. The thing that allowed me to go from being a parent who was struggling um, in in a way that was really concerning for people who were watching me struggle to being a parent who really um, eventually went on to become the parent that everyone was coming to for advice was the difference was creativity. And I didn't know it at that time. What I started to do was I started to think about how can I solve these problems in a better way? And intuitively, because a lot of being creative is intuitive, it's natural, we are all born with the ability, we just have it trained out of us. And um, we, I started to go back to that. And I started to, to find ways to solve my parenting challenges, that were somewhat unique and unusual. And as we know, you know, that's exactly what creativity is. It's, it's finding new and useful ways to solve, um, solve problems. And I started to do that. And it, it transformed my experience of being a parent to the point where I went from being extremely depressed. And of course, there was therapy and, and, you know, um, other interventions involved as well. But that creativity is what allowed me to change my pathway as, as a mother. And it allowed me to parent in a way that it became a team activity. My children became part of this journey of parenting. And um, collectively, we started to work on this challenge of raising adults. And that completely transformed um, us as a family. Mm -hmm. And it really transformed me from feeling like I was failing and and uh, in in deep crisis mode to coming out of it kind of like a phoenix rising from the ashes <laughs> and and I wanted other parents to have that experience which is actually why I went on to study creativity and I I got my graduate degree went to graduate school at the age of 40 um, in a completely different arena from my previous career path um, yeah. for that purpose so. Yeah, so it has a very different origin, doesn't it, to kind of how we often think about creativity or how we're taught to think about creativity and keeping it exactly. in its box. You're kind of, yeah, it's much more holistic and life-based uh, experience Absolutely. to you to where you are. And it's really interesting. You know, I've heard many people say before about creativity being trained out of us by our educational system. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it sounds like that's a big part of what you're focused on is, is how to help children to maintain that creativity that they naturally have so is there anything else you want to say around that kind of that that space around kind of 
how yeah. we can help him maybe his parents or um educators Absolutely. how do we stop them from losing that stuff uh, when they put it there already <laughs> well there's these this card deck is a great mm -hmm. way to start i mean you can use it with your family you can use it in your classrooms but um really at the very heart of it, if we can understand what creativity is and what it means, what does it look like in practice? And here are 54 examples of what it looks like in practice. Um, then we start to recognize it and we start to value it. And um, from appreciative inquiry, which is you know your domain, Martin, there, we know that when you pay attention to something, then you see more of it right? You encourage more of it. So even just by recognizing creativity when it happens, valuing it, uh, rewarding it, drawing attention to it will promote the amount of creativity that we see in our children. And we do a lot of work with educators and parents around creativity. Um, and the very first thing is understanding what is creativity, being able to identify it. And then the second piece of it is really modeling it because our children practice what we show them. They don't practice what we tell them. So it's critical that we start to model what it means to be creative to our children as educators, as parents, as role models in any capacity. You know, I, I remember being influenced by people who weren't my teachers, who weren't my parents, um, just they, they did something, the way they interacted with others. I noticed that. And now when I look back and I think about people who had a really uh, positive or significant impact on the way, the kind of person I shaped up to be, they were being creative. They were being creative role models and they weren't even aware of it. Now, imagine if they had been aware of their own creativity and had been deliberate about it, the impact that they would have had would have increased many fold. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I want people to be able to do. And that's, um, I don't say you have to do it all or nothing. Start anywhere. Start with one thing. Start with one habit and mm -hmm. start to think about what, how that relates to being creative and uh, talk about it you know, draw people's attention to it and why you're doing it. And it starts to create that, get that ball rolling. Yeah, yeah, and you can continue in that direction. Absolutely. Now, I know you've got another exercise idea kind of here on table three, uh, another example of, yes. of how you can use the cards in a different way. So do you want to talk us through what we're looking at here? Absolutely. This is actually a way in which I think teams and groups can use these cards and have used these cards. So usually when a team is working on a project um, and they may have had experiences where it hasn't been an entirely pleasant experience. I mean, many of us have worked on team projects where you're willing in the end to say, just everyone get out of my way and just let me do it myself because it's easier than trying to, to um, work together. These cards and these activities can become really great um, kind of team contracts. And you, you create a contract that says, when we are in project phase one, for example, and we're gathering data, let's commit to using this particular approach to doing that. And what that does is it sets a very clear expectation and it creates a, a way in which we're going to collaborate. It creates an agreement in terms of how we can collaborate and the third and, and possibly the important piece here is it's also a way in which to be creative because just by adding the word else, we're encouraging people to diverge, which is one of the fundamental um, activities related to being creative, uh, to creative mm -hmm. thinking is uh, divergent thinking then followed by convergent thinking. So when you are working together on a team, if you were to say in the phase one of this project, let's make sure that we are all committed to gathering data in this way and that we're all uh, going to be using the same approach and we're not going to challenge each other when someone introduces that approach. Then think about the next phase of a project, which is, you know, when people start to generate ideas. Now, how many times have you been in a team where someone says, well, I need some ideas for 
X, Y, and Z. And the minute you start to generate ideas and, and offer ideas, they start to evaluate them. And nine times out of 10, the evaluation comes in the form of an idea killer. And these might sound extreme, that will never work. That's a dumb idea, are you kidding me? But they might also sound like we've already tried that or mm-hmm. you know, um, the boss will never agree to it. We don't have the funds for that. Any kind of evaluation as you're generating ideas is a surefire way to kill, kill divergent thinking. It's, it's, it's the way that you bring a brainstorming session to a complete screeching halt. Mm-hmm. So just the awareness around the fact that um, we need to avoid idea killers and instead use idea builders can create an environment in a team where ideas are exchanged more freely and uh, the team creates and generates far more options than they might have otherwise. So here's here's a way to do that and have a contract around that. And then being being deliberate about, um, you know, when you put an idea into action, then making sure that you're learning from that experience so that it's an iterative process. I mean, they, we talk about the iterative process and prototyping and um, in design thinking and even in creative problem solving. But the thing is, we talk about it, but we don't know how to do it. How do you, how do you actually go through this process of learning by doing? Well, now the team has a way. They have a way to actively learn from the experiments that they're doing. They have a way to deploy a prototype and then um, sit back and learn from that experience and and distill for insights from that experience. So these are just the cards offer ways, not just for individuals to elevate their ability to be creative, but they also provide ways for teams to be more effective, collaborative, creative, um, and productive when they're So when you're using them in this kind of context, then would you have the team select cards as a group and discuss which ones they feel are the most appropriate to take something from? Absolutely. So you might have a team think about the life cycle of a project. And you might say, okay, if we had to think about what is phase one, what does phase one look like? And you might even add a couple of post-its on the, on the table that might say in phase one, this is what we're doing. These are the tasks we need to accomplish in phase one. And then you start thinking about which of the cards might help us do that better do that more effectively. And so you pull those cards onto the table. Here we pulled one card for project phase one, but if we took the time with the team, and this is just an example, to first build out, you know, what are the, what is the, uh, the goal of phase one of a project then, and put that on post-its and then matched up cards to each of those post-its or found a card that addressed all of those, um, then you would really be creating a, a team uh, contract that would be created one by the team based mm-hmm. on their specific needs, and um, and then they have a vested interest in in using that because they've built it. <clears throat> and then you do the same for for each of the other phases. And I love that you know the fact that we can add post its here. It means that we can actually say, all right, right here, right now, let's talk about what are the the critical elements of phase two. What do we need to do? Where do we get stuck? And then you find the solutions in the deck and you pull them out and you say, okay, this might work for us. You can even modify what's in the deck and say, well, this version of that might work for us. And so you can actually build something together right here um, on the table. Absolutely. And then we can use the the functionality within DeckHive as well to then have breakout discussions or paired discussions, for example, as part of that process. Because I guess sometimes that kind of breaking up the the group dynamic can help to kind of create different ideas so that you can actually avoid. Yeah. Yeah. You could even assign different project phases to different team members and Mm. say, all right, in your breakout group, you work on phase one and come back with recommendations for how we might put phase one into action and how we might put phase two into action. Mm. Okay, and then then people would just go through, they'd select the cards that were relevant, 
uh, and have the discussion in here like that and be able to turn Absolutely. them over. And, yes. Yeah, cool. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask people if they have any questions. So if anybody here wants to ask Izzy a question before we finish, then please uh, gather your thoughts about what the question would be and feel free to write it into the chat and we'll have a look at that in just a second. Uh, you'll be very welcome to unmute as well if you want to ask in person. Uh, and while you're having a think about that, let me just uh, recap for those of you who don't already know what Deck Hive is as a platform and how it works. So obviously we're looking at uh, the cards that Izzy's created here, the Being Creative Deck. And that is one of a number of decks that we have in our library, a growing library of decks that are available. So I'll just quickly close this session down um, and then I can show you what's in the library right now because we have a number of uh, new decks in here just recently added. Uh, so we have um, the starter decks that you'll see at the top here, which are those that are available uh, on our free plan. Uh, so they're designed just to get you up and running and using the platform to figure out how it works. And we hope they'll be useful, but they are, um, as the name suggests, fairly, star uh, fairly basic uh, starter decks. Um, but in certain circumstances, they could be very useful. And then we have the remainder of our deck, which are only accessible if you're on one of our paid plans. So we have a starter plan, which allows you to run five sessions a month, or an unlimited plan, which I'm sure you can guess what that does. Um, and that allows you, in both cases, to access all of these decks that are on here. So there you can see the, uh, the Being Creative deck. And we have some values cards, strengths cards, um, and we have some around appreciative inquiry, uh, some around emotions. The Pathways deck has got some lovely pictures on around um, strategy yeah. and, and the, the future visioning and direction you're heading. Uh, and then we have some other cards that are suited for all children and teenagers around strengths. Uh, some Liminal Muse is a photo deck, um, motivation cards and, and cards, cards for clear thinking, which just got added today. So um, there are lots of others on their way too, um, but that's what you can get access to. And in all cases with these sessions, then you'll be able to save the sessions and then reopen them to continue your work with a group uh, in the future. And as Izzy was just saying, then you can add sticky notes and so on to structure the session or to add reflections as you're going through. And it's really easy to invite people. So you can either share things on screen um, or if you really want to get interactive, the best way to do that is to invite people to join the session simply by creating the share link and, and sending that to them and then they can join the session and move the cards around flip them over themselves as well so it feels properly interactive just as it would if you had the real cards with you in, in front of you on the table um, so that's how we've designed the, the, the system to work so if you have any questions around deck hive as a platform then uh, we do run some other sessions around tutorials and introductions to the functionality so look out for those on our uh, eventbrite page and we'll circulate details to everybody who signed up to this session uh, afterwards so I think that's all I wanted to say on that. So I guess we'll just see if there's any questions from those of you who've joined us live. Um, and for those who haven't joined live, is you happy for people to get in touch uh, if they've got any questions for you directly afterwards? Yes, absolutely. Do they have a way to get in touch with me through DeckHive? Or should uh, well, I offer my email address? Uh, well, the way that they could is by going to your deck within the library, and then they can click on learn more about Beyonder. And then from there, they'll be able to see uh, your website uh, and your social media. That's so they perfect. can contact you through that that way. But we can also maybe include um, your email address in the, the email follow up we send if, if you'd like to do that. Absolutely. We have but any do. questions for now? Anybody here want to unmute or add a question to the chat? I don't see any coming. No, it's always that unsettling moment isn't it when you don't know whether people are making a cup of tea or whether they're, they're just about to ask some uh, incredibly yeah. insightful question and um, but my, my question would be can beyond what we've already talked about what's your favorite way of using I mean, there's lots of different examples you talked about but what's your favorite way of using the cards um if you have one i mean you may not have a favorite one but is there one that jumps out to mind that's different to what you talked about i really like the idea of um picking a card for yourself and picking one for someone else. Hi, Diana. Mm. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. We can, yes. Do you, well, do you have a question? Was, well, I, um, I just wanted to thank you both. This has been really great. And I'm an educator. Um, I've loved Ismet's work and wanted to know about uh, more about it. I consider myself a creative and yet for creative problem solving, I can use this for um, 
for myself and for helping others that are not, um, let's say, uh, the young people and the older students who I, I teach adults and children. Um, I think this is a fantastic way to help uh, inspire people to do what I do uh, innately. I've never been able to teach creative thinking because it just comes to me. So it's hard to discern what is it I'm doing? And I'm just so excited that Ismet put the time and research into coming up with a practical way for me to take it. I, it's not a question. It's inspired me to um, ask not what my head of school can do for me, but ask what I can do for my head of school. And I'd like to propose that I be the um, a, a team uh, participant in helping people be creative around ideas to make meetings more fruitful. So thank you. Oh, you're yes. welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very excited. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. It's nice to, Thank nice you, to Diana. hear that. Thank you. Hi, John, have, have, you, uh, have you become visible because you've got a, a okay, great yeah. question uh, for us? Uh, just a, a thought of sharing. I mean, I come into this uh, uh, that does because I recently attended the IPPA conference and I find that it's something interesting. And in fact, I signed up for the paid version, the low end, the $10 a month uh, kind of things. Um, nice. I've been using uh, creativity sessions. I do, I'm a corporate trainer. I use uh, Lego series play methodology and I've been using some cards and I thought uh, when I saw the deck hive, I say, this is interesting. Uh, I have a choice of cards, so I thought I signed it up. And uh, thanks, Ismet, for the sharing and some of the approaches, how I can use it. And uh, so I'm going to be with the deck hive to use in my corporate training. Uh, thanks for Wonderful. the opportunity. I think probably I drop a note, Martin. I think. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. We're really good yeah. to hear hear what you do and how you get on with it. And um, yeah. we, we're really I'm keen to get Singapore. feedback. I'm calling from Singapore. No? Okay. Oh, thank fantastic. You. Excellent. Well, I guess it's late in the day for you, so thank you for, uh, for joining. It's about almost going to be 9 p.m. Yeah, seven hour difference between London. Yeah, thanks a lot. I really appreciate. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, John. I do have a request. If you do use the cards either in the school, Diana or John, with your corporate training work, uh, I'd love to hear how you're using them. So if you can reach out to me through my website or um, in through the email that I will share. Um, later with you, please do. I would love to hear and, and I'd love to be able to talk to you about how you might use them. So if you're ever stuck with ways in which to use the cards uh, more effectively, you know, I'd, I'd uh, like to see how we can help. And Diana, actually, my next project that's kind of on the back burner is building a, a version of the deck for use with children. So, I'm happy if you need it. <laughs> absolutely absolutely so i'm always looking for for ideas and collaborators and and yes we can we can definitely um talk about that someone has a question here that says how would you use the cards to help clients with career change so that's a really great question uh samara what i would suggest is using it in a coaching session to identify perhaps cards that change something from what they have always done before. Because usually when, when people are trying to bring about a change in their lives, they're only trying to change something externally. And what I find is external change is not something you can control. What you can control is internal change. And so inviting them to find a card that um, will shift their thinking or their practice in a way that will create an internal change that will result in, in uh, facilitating the external change that they're looking for. So I hope that's helped to answer your question. Uh, thank you, Izzy. You're welcome. Excellent. Well, should we leave it there? Because I know everyone will have things to get back to, but it's been a lot of fun to have this conversation today and um, and to hear about the background and the ways that you've used the cars and those well, very inspiring stories about the difference that they've made and, and it's it's one of those things i think with a product like this isn't it that you, i'm sure you only ever hear of a fraction of those times when it's had a real impact on people so we all i know what it's like you we, they're very precious aren't they when you hear those stories and you get the feedback from people about you how they've bet. used the cars yeah. yes so that's absolutely fantastic. 
So thank yeah, you. thank you for your time for being here and um, thank you all for joining us and for, for watching if you're watching the recording. And uh, we hope to see you at one of the other sessions. We have a number, as I said at the start, there are a number of other sessions uh, in this theme of Deck Hive Introduces, uh, where we talk to the creators of various decks of cards in our library. So we already have a few recorded, so you're welcome to go and watch any of those if you'd like to. And you can fast forward through the bits that aren't so interesting um, when you're watching a recording. That's always a benefit of doing things after the event, isn't it? Um, so, but we'll hope, hopefully see you at some of the, uh, the other live ones in the future. So thanks to Great. all of you. We'll see you Thank again soon. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>